Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we are busy with chapter four. Chapter four is about differential relations for fluid flow. We've started by deriving firstly the acceleration field uh, of a fluid. Then we've derived a few, deriva a few equations which are called differential equations, which were different than that in the previous paragraph or the previous chapter, which were integral equations. And these differential equations were for the continuity or uh, the continuity equation or mass conservation. Then we had one for linear momentum, angular momentum, and for energy. So those are our basic equations. And after that, I've asked you to look at the boundary conditions. We've looked at the stream function with the previous lecture. And today we're going to look at vorticity and irrotationality, paragraph 4.8. And also, I hope, paragraph 4.9, frictionless irrotational flow. Okay. Paragraph 4.8, vorticity and irrotationality. Fancy words, and in many cases, students find it very difficult to understand what it is. And I can understand that. It is a little bit abstract. Okay, so what I'm going to do is, I'm going to do my best to show it to you in terms of mathematics, what it means mathematically, and then I'm going to try to show you schematically what we mean with it. Okay. In the textbook there is sort of a derivation that you can also try, if that would help you, but I'm not so sure if that is going to really help you to understand what we mean with vorticity and irrotationality. Okay. Now, with vorticity and irrotationality, it is about an assumption. And it's about the assumption of zero fluid angular velocity. Zero fluid angular velocity. And if that is the case, then the fluid is called irrotational, irrotational, irrotational fluid. Let's consider fluid through a body like that. Okay. If we look at that fluid element, then let's call it in real life, there will be an angular velocity, okay. there will be shear stresses on that fluid element, while with irrotational flow, we say that those stresses are zero. So if we look at that small control volume, it's going to flow through our flow domain without being deformed. That is what it is about. Okay. Now mathematically, it means that the curl of the velocity vector should be equal to zero. So that is what it means mathematically. And then it can be written as the vorticity. The vorticity zeta is equal to two omega and that is equal to the curl of the velocity vector v so this is the vorticity, the sign for vorticity, where omega is equal to the half of the curl of the velocity vector <coughs> which is equal to half following matrix IJK, DDX, DDY, and DDZ of U, V, and W. <coughs> like that. Okay. So the vorticity, this two, okay, this two, sort of means the vorticity is two times irrotationality and why do we use this concept of vorticity? It is just to get rid of the annoying half. So that's the only reason, to get rid of that half in the equation. 
Okay, now if we look at irritational flow, against rotational flow with irrotational flow with the previous lecture we've started with the continuity equation and the linear momentum equation made quite a few assumptions and then we wrote the momentum equation in terms of one function which was the stream function which can be solved as a function of x and y. And to solve it in even further, we've made the, the assumption of the viscosity is equal to zero and also of irrotationality. And the result of that was the Laplace equation, partial d2 psi dx squared plus partial d2 psi dy squared is equal to zero. Okay. So, this would typically be irrotational flow. And if you go and solve this equation, you will always see that the streamlines does that. They sort of are parallel towards each other, but they never cross each other. So they never cross. Okay. Well, with rotational flow, we can have a streamline, and you can think of it as a particle, an air particle that you follow, and then, once you finish this ride, you get onto the next air particle, but this air particle might do something like that. Well, this one might do that. Okay. So you can see the streamlines can cross. So that is an easy way of showing what is the difference between irrotational flow and a rotational flow. So if the flow is irrotational, then the vorticity is equal to zero. Okay, so the vorticity is equal to zero if we have irrotational flow. Vorticity, which means that W would also be equal to zero. And in this case, it would mean that the shear strain rate, the shear strain rate, on a control volume, remember CV is a control volume, is not equal to zero. While in that case, the shear strain rate would be equal to zero. So that is the difference between the two, and that is mathematically how we determine if a flow field is irrotational or not. So if in the test or exam I give you a flow field where V is equal to wah 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 and I ask you is it an irrotational flow field then you check that if it's equal to zero it's irrotational. If it's not equal to zero it is irrotational. Okay. It's as easy as that. Any questions on Paragraph 4.8. Nothing? Okay. Why don't we do an example? <coughs> an example? And the example is, let's look at a flow field, a given flow field where the velocity vector is equal to 10x minus 10y in the j direction plus 30k in the z direction. And the question is determined Firstly, if it's incompressible flow, and secondly, if the flow is irrotational. So that is what you should determine. 
Okay, let's start with the A part. With the continuity equation. Okay, the continuity equation in Cartesian coordinate systems is equal to d rho dt plus partial rho u dx plus partial rho v dy plus partial rho w dz is equal to zero. Okay. In terms of the flow field, nothing was said about time. How things change as a function of time. So it is quite reasonable that we can say this flow field must be the flow field of steady flow. Must be steady flow. No changes as a function of time. Okay. Then, if the flow field is incompressible, then the densities must be equal to a constant. All the densities must be equal to a constant. If that is the case, then we can take them out and we can say the density multiplied by d rho dx plus the density multiplied by dv dy plus the density multiplied by dw dz is equal to zero. We can divide right through with the density and the result is partial du dx plus partial dv dy plus partial dw dz is equal to zero. Do you agree? Now, we would like to do the differentiation. U, U is equal to 10x. V is equal to minus 10y. And Z is equal to 30. So d u dx is equal to partial 10x dx. U is equal to 10x, so we just do the substitution. Plus d minus 10y dy plus partial z is 30, dz should be equal to 0. If we do the differentiation of the first term, it is equal to ddx of 10x is equal to 10. Okay. If we do the differentiation of the second term, it is equal to minus 10. That one is equal to 0. So 0 is equal to 0, so we can say yes, that flow field is an incompressible flow field because it also satisfied the continuity equation for incompressible flow. Francois, you agree? Okay. The next part is to determine if the flow is irrotational. Okay. So for irrotational flow, For irrotational flow, the vorticity must be equal to zero. Thus, if we now look at this matrix, the vorticity is equal to dw dy minus dv dz in the i direction so dw dy minus dv dz okay then the second one 
I don't know if that is how you did it in mathematics, so you can use your own way of doing it. Plus, du dz minus dw dx in the j direction plus dv dx minus du dy in the k direction. The second term is it this one? The UDZ? This one? Oh, yeah. Is it, is it right? Yeah, it's right. I think so. Okay. What did I do wrong? Is it fine? It's fine, yeah. Okay, okay. Okay. So you can write it out like that. So let's first consider this one. We do it term by term. Okay, the first one, dw dy minus dv dz is equal to d dy of w and w is equal to 30 minus d dz of v and v is equal to minus 10y so that is equal to 0 minus 0 is equal to 0 And then we can do the next one, partial du dz minus dw dx is equal to d dz of 10x minus d dz of 30. And again it is equal to 0 minus 0, so it is equal to 0. Okay, and the last one, Vdx minus du dy, you can go and do that yourself, but you'll see it is also equal to zero, so therefore the vorticity is equal to zero, and therefore we can say it's an irrotational flow field. Irrotational flow field. <coughs> okay. Right, let's continue with paragraph 4.9. Paragraph 4.9 is frictionless. Irrotational flow. Frictionless irrotational flow. We start by considering the momentum equation. And the momentum equation, rho g minus the grad of P plus the grad of tau ij is equal to rho multiplied by dv dt. And let's call that equation 1. going to make 
some assumptions. The first assumption, assumption one, is to say that the flow that we're going to consider is frictionless. If it's frictionless, then that term is equal to zero. Okay? This term we know can be written as, well not the row, just this part, this part, dvdt is equal to partial dvdt, the chain rule, plus you can write it like that you don't need to follow all the mathematics in detail now. Okay, so just look in principle what we're doing. Okay. Now that part of the equation can be written as the grot of half V plus the vorticity cross vector multiplied by the velocity equation 2 <coughs> now if we substitute equation 2 in 1 and we divide by a row and we rearrange and we write the equation in a vector displacement form Okay, so there are quite a few steps that I'm not going to do yet. You write it in a vector displacement form, you get the following equation. dv dt partial plus the grot of a half v square plus the vorticity cross vector multiplied by the velocity plus 1 divided by rho grot P minus G dr and that is equal to zero Now, integrate along a streamline. Integrate along a streamline. If we integrate along a streamline, then we can get the equation, the integral from 1 to 2, dv dt, ds plus the integral from 1 to 2 dp divided by rho plus a half v2 square minus v1 square plus g multiplied by Z, z2 minus z1 and that is equal to zero. You start recognizing this equation? Start recognizing this equation? The Bernoulli equation. So the Bernoulli equation comes from this derivation okay. and it can then be written as the pressure divided by the density plus a half V squared plus GZ is equal to a constant along a streamline. constant along a streamline. Now let's call this equation 3. Equation 3. Okay. That's equation 3. When you've done it, it's the Bernoulli equation. But I think what you didn't realize is the following. And that is that, let's call it for a normal flow field. 
a normal flow field, a real a life one. If we look at streamlines, that does maybe this. Okay, so they cross. Some of the streamlines cross. Then, according to equation three, according to equation three, that constant, the constant along the streamline, okay, that constant might be have a value of five. I'm just choosing an arbitrary value now, five. Okay. The next streamline, also, that equation three might have a value of four. Okay. And the next one <coughs> might have a value of two. Okay. So this is normal flow, or rotational flow, <coughs> normal well if the flow is irrotational okay, then the streamlines do not cross and if we look at equation 3 if we look at equation 3 then the streamline values will all be the same Okay, let's suppose 10. And this would then be irrotational flow. So for irrotational flow, the constant is all the same. For rotational flow, it is not the case. Okay. Do you follow? In terms of the Bernoulli equation that you've been using up to now, what does it mean? What would be the implications be? The implications would be that last year you've used this equation and you've kept that constant the same. You remember? Which means that the flow that you were solving was irrotational flow. Okay. Any questions? Okay. Paragraph 4.10. Incompressible viscous flow. Okay, incompressible viscous flow. When we derived the differential equations, I told you that we were looking for a general analytical equation for all those equations, and that most probably if you can do that, you'll get the Nobel Prize for mathematics. Okay. Now, analytical solutions are available for a few selected problems. Usually, all very simple in terms of geometry and lots of assumptions that are being made. But in many cases, very useful results that we can use. And also in many cases, when you go and get a CFD solution of something, you can actually go back to some of these analytical solutions and you can go and check if the CFD results are correct. And it is the responsible thing to do. You're supposed to do that. Okay. Now the first type of problem, which is the easiest one, is called cohet flow. Cohet flow. Cohet flow. And cohet flow starts with two flat plates. Two flat plates. In terms of our Cartesian coordinate system, look where it is placed. It is placed in the center xy so that this distance is y is equal to minus h and this distance is y is equal to plus h.
Okay. Something else that has been done is that this plate is moved at a constant velocity v. So we are moving the top plate and we've got a fluid in between. Okay. And if we look at it very carefully, we will see that this velocity is a function of y only. And that is the direction of gravity. Let's first start with the continuity equation. Continuity equation. Continuity equation, d rho dt plus partial rho u dx plus partial rho v dy plus partial rho w dz is equal to zero. We've used this continuity a few, a few times over the past week. Okay, the continuity equation. And now we're going to start making the assumptions. The first assumption is steady flow. Flow is steady. If that is the case, what can we say about the equation? If it's steady, then that term must be equal to zero. So let's put in the A1 to indicate that that is the reason. That is the reason because the flow is steady. Okay, the second assumption is it is incompressible flow. Incompressible, which means that the density must be equal to a constant. Okay. If the density is equal to a constant, then just as previously we can say the density multiplied by d rho of du dx plus the density multiplied by the phi dy plus the density rho multiplied by partial dw dz is equal to zero. Again, divide by the density, and it gives us du dx plus dv dy plus dw dz is equal to zero. Okay. The third assumption, the third is assumption that is being made is that it is a two-dimensional problem. Two-dimensional. So this plate is very long in this direction and we are not looking at any changes in the z direction. So it's a two-dimensional flow field so that is assumption three takes away that term there. Okay, the fourth one which is not sort of an assumption but a logical observation if we look at that thing long enough, okay, if we look at the flow field in it long enough, what happens to the velocity in the y direction? The velocity in the y direction is zero. Okay. Because all the flow just moves in this direction. There's no velocity going in that direction. Okay. So the fourth as assumption is that the velocity is equal to zero. If the velocity is equal to zero, then dv dy must also be equal to zero. Okay. So the fourth assumption takes care of that term there. So the result of the continuity equation is that partial du dx is equal to zero. Partial du dx is equal to zero. Okay. 
So partial to u dx is equal to zero. So if we look at the velocity, the velocity there, the velocity there, the velocity there, it is all equal to the same value. And we can see that u is a function of y only. u is not a function of x. Okay. It's a function of y only. Right, let's look at the Navier-Stokes equation. In S, Navier-Stokes in the x direction. Okay, the Navier-Stokes equation in the x direction. The Navier-Stokes in the x direction says rho multiplied by g minus partial dp dx plus the viscosity multiplied by partial d2u dx squared plus partial d2u dy squared plus partial d2u dz squared is equal to rho multiplied by du dt. That is just the x term. You can go and write down the y terms and the z terms also and you can go and look at all the terms and you also see that you cannot really use those two so that is the only equation that's going to give you something that you can do something with. Okay. If we look at the equation then this term we've made assumption one so we've said the flow is steady. Okay. No changes. DDT is equal to zero. So that term is equal to zero. We've also said the flow is two-dimensional. So that is assumption three. <coughs> Takes care of that term there. Okay. The gravity we can see is in this direction. So gravity doesn't work in the x direction. So gravity is a function of the y direction. So we can take care of that equation there. <coughs> okay. The pressure gradient is another assumption we're going to say the pressure gradient in the x direction is equal to zero. There's no pressure difference in the x direction. So if we measure the pressure there and the pressure there, it's going to be the same. Of course, we move the plate at the same speed. Okay. And what do we have left? We have left partial d2u dx squared plus partial d2u dy squared is equal to zero. But there's something that you need to help me with now. What can we say about these two terms? One of them can also disappear. Which one and why? The continuity equation told us the u to x is equal to zero. So, if that is equal to zero, then the second derivative is also equal to zero. Okay. So that is from the continuity equation. Continuity equation gets rid of that term there. And the result is that partial d2u dy squared is equal to zero, or we can say d2u dy squared, not partial, is equal to zero because u is a function of y only. It's not a function of x. Okay, we can do the first integration. So du dy 
is equal to C1, the constant C1. Integrate again, so it is C1 multiplied by Y plus C2. Okay. We need to solve that equation. We need two boundary conditions. The first boundary condition, BC1, is boundary condition. Boundary condition 1. Okay. Boundary condition 1 is at Y equal plus H u is equal to the velocity v okay. where y is equal to plus h that plate is moving at the velocity v the second boundary condition at y equal minus h u is equal to zero Okay. Very simple to solve. You've done that a million times, so I'm not going to write it out for you. But you can then go and solve the constant C1 and C2. Okay. C1 is equal to V divided by 2H and C2 is equal to V divided by 2. So that we can go and write that the velocity u is equal to v divided by 2h multiplied by y plus v divided by 2. So that gives us the velocity distribution between two flat plates. And it's very close to what is going to happen in practice. So it's a very useful equation. Now we can start making things more complicated. Okay. We can start making things more complicated. We can say that, okay, let's keep this velocity equal to zero. Let's keep the, make this velocity equal to zero. And then you can go and solve it again. Just another boundary condition. That is another option that we have. Another option is to say, well, let's do not say that the pressure drop is equal to zero. Let's take the pressure drop into consideration, the PDX. Okay. If you do that, if you do that, that is in the textbook the so-called case B of the same problem. So the PDX is then not equal to zero, and V, the top plate, is zero. Okay. Then you can do the derivation and then u would be equal to minus the PDX H squared divided by two times the viscosity multiplied by one minus Y squared divided by H squared. Very simple to derive it. Nothing complicated about it. Right. Now after this, there's the case of flow through a pipe. Okay. Flow through a pipe, and this one is very much the same. If V is equal to zero. If V is equal to zero, and we say it's not a Cartesian coordinate system, but now it's a cylindrical coordinate system, we need to start with a continuity equation, not in a Cartesian coordinate system, but in a cylindrical one. And also the momentum equation. And then, you're going to end up with the velocity distribution through a pipe, which is going to give you the perfect parabolic flow distribution. Okay. 